keynote will be delivered by Stephen Downs. Stephen Downs was born in Montreal, Quebec, and has lived and worked across Canada before joining the National Research Council as a senior researcher in November of 2001. Currently based in Moncton, New Brunswick, at the Institute for Information Technologies Internet Logic Research Group, Stephen has become a leading voice in the areas of learning objects and metadata, web logs and education, content syndication, digital rights, and related issues. Stephen is perhaps best known for his daily research newsletter, OL Daily, short for Online Learning Daily, which reaches thousands of readers across Canada and around the world. I now present to you Stephen Downs. Hi, thanks. Hi, everyone. Now, how do I want to get started here? I want to get started, first of all, by telling you that you will be producing your own slides for this event. <laughs> so, let's get rid of the slideshow. Shall we? And if you have a laptop computer connected to the wireless that is available in this room, and you know that there is wireless available in this room, or if you have a mobile device, such as an iPhone or something like that, that can pick up the Wi Fi, if you go to that website, you'll see a form that looks like that. And into that form, you can type whatever content you wish. And I mean that quite literally, whatever content you wish. So I'll type from this screen, I'll type something like hello. And I'll scroll down because it's very small on this computer. You can't see this computer. But I'll submit it here in a few seconds. If the world is working as it should, you can see the uh, screen delays for 10 seconds. And so the message that you type will show up like that for 10 seconds. And then it will disappear into the obscurity of the archives. If you look at the uh, comment screen, there's somebody who's in already. If you just go in anonymously, you will be given the name Any Mouse. And uh, if you would like to see the archives, you can see the archives. And here's somebody who's all, they're already testing it. Here's two that haven't shown up yet. I sure can. And now I realize I've messed up the URL a bit, so. Now, when now the uh, basically it runs through a queue of messages, and when it runs out, it displays the URL. But the URL is simply this bit at the top. Linux friendly, of course, it's Linux friendly. So downs.ca slash cgi slash cchat.cgi. And I'll just type that in because it looks like I'm not going to get in edgewise with the message otherwise. <laughs> oh, there it is. I don't need to type it. Never mind. There's your URL. And again, any, any time the Q runs out of messages, <laughs> it uh, technically is 508 compliant, but you have to supply access to the software on the input end. Uh, what that means is the uh, form will take not just plain text, but any HTML you care to put in there. That includes photographs, that includes embedded YouTube videos, that is, and if, if you catch me fast enough, I'll play the video. If somebody watches the video, and you only have 10 seconds to get me to turn around and hit the play on YouTube thing. Uh, it includes embedded objects or whatever. So, but right now I'm just going to back out of this for a second 
I'm sorry to turn my back to you like this. That's just the way I'm set up here. Um, what did I want to do? Oh, yes. The slides for my talk, and here they are, are also available on my website in case you really can't live without seeing the slides. Just go to this URL here, downs.ca slash presentation slash 191, and you'll be able to see the slides. They've been loaded on a site called slideshare.net. How many of you are familiar with slideshare? Lots. Good. There goes half my talk. Thanks. Um, so you, you can see the... Uh, See the slides on SlideShare and see where it's going and uh, probably in about five minutes or so as people will get a flurry of people leaving because I thought I've seen all this before. <laughs> so, go back and see if any people have been adding comments. I want to talk today, and I don't have a huge amount of time, I have 45 minutes minus whatever I've wasted to the mess. On, uh, good. I really do prefer to have this screen here so I can see the comments as they come up because I, I do find it a bit difficult. So from time to time, I will actually uh, present like this. So, anyhow, uh, I want to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to prepare a talk that I'm in some other country and they go into triple overtime. <laughs> it's like jet lag, the hockey way. Uh, I want to talk about light, agile, flexible, collaborating the web 2.0 way. The talk is split into four major sections. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Web 2.0, you'll see bits you know, bits you don't know, hang in there. It all comes together with the theme. The four sections, first of all, I'll make some very brief remarks about the nature of collaboration. Nothing deeply insightful there, but it's some ground I want to cover. Secondly, a quick look at some of the tools. Thirdly, a look at the trends. That's good. <laughs> To know, I had to use the hotel conditioner <laughs> because, because I, I didn't bring my regular leaf on man. And the fourth section I want to talk about is about philosophies. Isn't that a repeat? Yeah. Yeah. Tiss, tiss, tiss. And how come I haven't seen any wall caps up there yet? I did this in, in Saskatchewan with a bunch of school teachers from Saskatoon, and they put up like two or three hundred messages during the course of the event. They had photographs, and, and the, the whole work was great. So it's interesting to compare. Now, I've done this, I think this is my fifth or sixth talk I've used this. And it's interesting to see the different characters of the crowds come out. And uh, as I warned the people in Saskatchewan, I said, you know, every time I've done this, the organizers of the conference have come to me after and apologized profusely for the behavior of their attendees. Oh, I like that. You do quiet. <laughs> All right, collaboration is, uh, to define it from Wikipedia, a process defined by the recursive interaction of the well, like that definition. Um, collaboration is actually a wide number of things. It has a lot to do with working together. It has a lot to do with working separately and communicating together. It has a lot to do with sharing applications. It has a lot to do with sharing results. Uh, collaboration, when we talked about collaboration, we typically, and I'm going to come back to this, associate collaboration with a process of teamwork of some sort. And we usually think of that as a process embedded in teamwork. For example, Gray in 1989 describes it as going through the process of problem setting, direction setting, and then structuring the output. Uh, the main idea of collaboration is working together. The, the main 
main idea of collaboration is a sharing, a sharing of planning, a sharing of decision making, solving problems, setting goals, assuming responsibility, communicating, and coordinating, etc. At least according to Bags and Schmidt. Uh, we can identify in the process of collaboration well, five major things, major themes, now again, with taxonomies, and there's this whole branch of critical education, criti critical pedagogy, that lives and dies, that's pretty good, that's my topic. No, I'm just kidding, I'm a horse, right? <laughs> you see, now if you take that photo, upload it to your Flickr account, you have a Flickr account, right? And then, when you're in your Flickr account, <laughs> edit the photo using Picnic. Picnic is an application that will take your photo from Flickr and import the application and let you edit it. Use Picnic, put some text on the photo that is relevant to the current discussion, save your photo, and then upload that photo to there. Can you do that? <laughs> The collaborative, pro collaborative process, the five major elements, team creation, and again, this is a taxonomy, it doesn't represent the state of affairs of the world, it's just a neat way to slice and dice the conversation. Team creation, idea generation, decision making, work or production, and evaluation or recap. So it's just a way of mapping out the field. So if we look at these each in turn, team creation, I really hate that phrase, but it comes from Katz and Back and Smith. Really, in my mind, what that means is connecting. You typically involve connecting or bringing together small numbers of people, usually to assemble complementary skills with a common purpose for working on agreed upon performance goals, and typically with some sort of shared working approach. It's a small group kind of thing, typically. <laughs> Idea generation. Again, the, the sort of like take a phrase and take all the life out of it and you get the phrase idea generation. But what we mean by that is creating the creation or the production, the producing process it involves things like brainstorming, concept mapping, breaking down a problem or analysis. Uh, who was it this morning? We were being called about breaking things down in, into the small parts and that. Storyboarding is part of this, uh, role playing is, is a type of creation, etc., those sorts of things. Again, I'm still mapping up the territory that we call collaboration. The third major section is decision making, the process of deciding. Uh, and you, we can think of a variety of different decision making processes. The autocratic mechanism, which is widely used. Um, the hand clasping clique type of decision making. You, know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. The consensus model of decision making. The deliberative, sorry, deliberative process model of decision making. Polling is a type of decision making. And then, as we've seen in the news a lot recently, the voting or the use of voting mechanisms. All of these are collaborative decision making processes, right? Work or production the process of producing or creating. And again, we can think of quite a few collaborative mechanisms for this type of work. Uh, functions such as execution, not, you know, with firing, you know, uh, tracking, timeline. No comments, eh? You're, you're being out-commented by Saskatchewan school teachers. Think about it. <laughs> Timelining, optimizing, the work or production involves a separation of roles, identification of responsibilities, allocation of individual work, uh, reporting and accounting to. It can be an iterative thing, like updating uh, articles in a Microsoft Word document. And it often involves a common environment. I'm reminded of that film uh, with Drew, Bar Drew Barrymore. Music and lyrics, right? That's a collaboration. They're in the same environment. They don't want to be in the same environment, but they are. Uh, then finally, evaluation. <laughs> well, we'll see if learning has occurred. There'll be a test at the end. <laughs> no, I like. Um, evaluation or recap, 
doing the tabulation of expectations and results, surveying, polling, scoring, measuring, etc. The processes by which we reflect on what has been done and decide whether or not it worked. So it's a very quick mapping of the field. And now I'm going to move to the tools part of the presentation. You notice? It's kind of interesting, right? There are no slides up there. So consequently, I'm a bit fast, you know, so I even almost anticipated that comment, because there's nothing for you to follow and just read. You have to read your own comment, which means you have to listen to me to know what's going on. And we're not used to that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but where's the text? Probably at the bottom of the photo, we, you didn't size the photo. <laughs> Oh, I don't know, basic you know. Okay. <laughs> Think about your basic tools environments, and, and like I'm trying to kind of push that a little bit here. You think about the basic needs. Computers, you have computers, we all have computers, mobile phones or PDAs. The wireless internet connection, and one of the things I was talking about was whether the wireless here would be able to handle the traffic. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, there. Uh, power outlets. How many power outlets are there here? Not nearly enough, are there? There's some on the wall, but that's about. This is a pre-internet. <laughs> is that something you can learn in college? I guess you would have to see it practiced in order to learn it. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, power outlets, display screens, or monitors, and uh, I'm on slide 14. Out of how many? <laughs> see, I like to quiz the audience interactively. So you need that basic sort of environment. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lol cat, by the way. I love lol cats because they're they're a way of communicating. We we typically think of communicating. We think of text. We think of words, right? And we typically think that the meaning of the communication is embedded in the text, right? You, you write a sentence. The meaning of the word is in the sentence. It's in the words. But that is not where the meaning is. The lol cats really demonstrate that because. They are used just like sentences and words that communicate from one person to another person, but the meaning of a law cat isn't in the law cat, it's in the cultural environment in which the law cat is used. That picture is funny because we know about cats, we know cats. That picture is funny is because we know what cats do when they walk on our computers. The picture is funny against a background of cultural and shared assumptions. But it was inevitable. <laughs> but the thing is, in the same way that law cats depend on culture for their meaning, so do words. <laughs> Which is why I pronounce the word out differently than you do. When I use the word out, it comes with a very different set of background knowledge and associations. That was an anteater. I must have missed the picture. So anyhow, we're talking about collaboration, the tools, the environment. After you've got your basic environment, you want your basic communications tools. This is the stuff we all grew up with, even me. Uh, email, message lists, uh, instant messaging, bulletin boards, discussion boards, even telephones and audio chat and all the rest. That's the former collaboration environment. Now what we have happening now is Web 2.0. And Web 2.0 is taking this process of collaboration that I outlined at the beginning of the talk too quickly according to some. And the tools, discussion boards, message boards, email, instant messaging and all the rest, is taking these tools and transforming them. So, what are the core technologies? What makes web? Which side of your brain are at the back side? Uh, <laughs> I couldn't resist. 
what are the core technologies of Web 2.0? You've probably been hearing a lot about Web 2.0 so far. You've probably seen a zillion Web 2.0 applications. I can show you Glyphy or whatever. But the core underlying technologies are actually fairly few in number and they're fairly basic in number. Or they're fairly basic in nature. The first technology, the one that we're most familiar with from being in the news is social networking. You've all seen, I'm sure, the horror stories about Facebook or MySpace or whatever. But social networking is one of the underlying technologies to Web 2.0. What social networking is, and let me put in parentheses, it is not Facebook, it is not MySpace. These are simply instances of social networking that have become popular and demonized. What social networking is, is the identification of a list of contacts, which are variously called friends, buddies, whatever. And it is this list of contacts that creates the set of connections that you will use in order to communicate with uh, society as a whole. Social networking begins long before the social networking sites. It begins, for example, with things like instant messaging, even ICQ, uh, or I guess other people use AOL instant messaging or MSN messaging or whatever. And if, or these days, people are using things like Skype, which is, again, the same concept. And you have a list of contacts, and, and that is social networking. That list is social networking. The combination of all the individual lists creates a social network. And social networking from an individual point of view is you with all of those contacts. The little black book is exactly the same technology except it's not electronic. But it's exactly the same model. And I, I will hasten to point out the mathematics that describes the way contacts are made using little black books is exactly the same as the mathematics that are used to describe the way contacts are made using instant messaging or using a site like Facebook, MySpace, or Orkut, or Friendster, or whatever. Because it's the same thing. It's one person with a set of connections to another. And it's covered under the heading of graph theory. <laughs> Social networking. <laughs> Is an escalate, what is that, the type of vehicle? <laughs> oh, okay, see, that's a culturally specific reference here. I have no idea what the point is. <laughs> <laughs> technology in social area in Web 2.0 is something that is called, kind of loosely, tagging. Now, tagging is shorthand for a, a wide range of behaviors. And the behavior is basically non-structured organization of data. Or another way of putting it, distributed organization of data. If you think about what tagging is, tagging was first used on sites like Technorati, uh, that's just technorati.com, it's uh, a blog indexing site, and it's also used on sites like Delicious, I always want to pronounce that Delicious, but you know. And all it is, is the, a person looks at a resource and into the form they type whatever word they think matches that resource. It's kind of like word association, and that's all it is. And the idea here is that the person is picking whatever word is appropriate to them to stand for that resource. I have a Flickr account, I put my photographs up on the Flickr account, and then I tag them. I pick the words I think are appropriate. Elm tree, Metcalf, Canada, Goose, whatever. You know, whatever I think is appropriate. And what's significant about tagging is two things. First of all, Tagging is the substitution of individual preferences, individual tastes, for controlled vocabularies or taxonomies. You pick the words that you think are most appropriate rather than selecting the word from predefined 
uh, from a predefined uh, vocabulary. Is that a comment? Yeah. Um, what happens to social skills if we're just tagging based on interests? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this, the human networking in a face-to-face -face environment requires some conversational skills, mm -hmm. social skills. So the, the question is, what happens to social skills if we're just tagging in a, in a computational environment? But the thing is, Tagging isn't intended to replace social skills. Right? It, it's, it's not a case of we're going to use tagging instead of talking to each other. Uh, basically, instead, it's we're going to use tagging instead of, say, using a library card catalog. We're going to use tagging instead of uh, the Library of Congress numbering system. So that's what tagging stands in place of. The, the other activities, the various social activities, both online and offline, still occur. They still take place. Uh, and, and tagging plays a role in those interactions. It plays a role, especially online, because it allows people to form communities of meaning that are based on shared or common tags. And a lot of that technology doesn't exist yet. And they also inform discussion offline, because they provide a basis for and, and, uh, and uh, the materials for discussion in a personal setting. So we're not, we're not replacing it with this. We're, it, we're, we're not even augmenting it with this because the use of tagging was going to shape and change some of those di dynamics. And this points to the second aspect of, of tagging that I wanted to point out. When individuals tag according to whatever terms they feel is most appropriate. Now, of course, they're not coming into this and just picking things off the top of their head, right? They're, they're bringing in a range of cultural background assumptions and knowledge and beliefs, etc. I look at a tree and I call it an elm tree because that's what I learned in my culture to call it. And the different associations that are brought in, it's a way of, of reading and interpreting what the culture as a whole thinks is good is, is representative of a resource, uh, is descriptive of a resource. And so what we're doing is we're substituting this wider community-based knowledge and we're using that knowledge rather than the centralized authoritative knowledge of a taxonomer or uh, uh, of a librarian, somebody who would deliberately work according to a predefined scheme. And this isn't, again, to say that the one necessarily replaces the other, but it gives us access to a view of that discipline that we didn't have before. We could talk about books and writing, anyhow. Uh, third major element. I'm just, I'm just like, why would you care if I've written a book? Just, why would that matter? Yeah. Um. <laughs> the third major element of Web 2.0 is what's called Ajax. And I'm sure many of you have heard of Ajax, You've probably been flying or flung, flinging around. Ajax is really very simple. It stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. And really all Ajax is, at, at its very heart, is you have a web page, and when you input web page, sorry, when you input data into the web page, instead of reloading the whole page all over again, your web page instead uses a little JavaScript to send the message to a web server, and the web server sends information back to the web page. And so it's a way of creating an interactive web page, a web page that you can do many interactions without reloading the page. Uh, that, that allows the state of the web page to remain essentially unchanged except for the precise interaction. You might think, well, who cares? But suppose you have a website on which you want to create a, a word processing system. You know, you want to use your web page to write things, just like you know, the text form. But you want to be able to save. 
If you use Ajax, you can have the page do all the saving in the background so that you are cons constantly working with a continuously, uh, continuously saved and continuously updated document. Now what this means is, in addition to you sending information to the web server, as you are creating, the web server can start sending information back to you. What sort of information? Well, suppose there's somebody else working on that same web page at that same time. You make a change, they make a change. If it's a typical, ordinary type of web page, you wouldn't be able to know that. But if the other person makes a change, as you're looking at that web page, the web page can retrieve the information and show it to you so that the change that's made by the other person is displayed in real time. Which means two people can edit the same document at the same time even though they're in remote locations and be able to see each other's work as it happens in real time. Now, this gets very interesting. Uh, the, uh, the Ajax that I talked about is restricted by uh, browser security. Uh... <laughs> well, I guess, and it's that too. And it, it also <laughs> contrasted with the well known conjure comment. That would be really off topic, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> The thing with Ajax is it uses a it uses the transfer of information through JavaScript using an HTTP request, and browser security protocols restrict that transfer to uh, information exchanges that information exchanges that happen <laughs> under the same domain, which means you have to be working at the same website all the time. So really, if I that's Really interesting things happen when you have websites actually working together, which means that you need a way for websites to communicate and send information back and forth with each other. Now, you've probably been hearing a lot about semantic web and web services and SOAP, Simple Object Access Protocol, but the web 2.0 way of doing it is very lightweight and very flexible. You don't need all kinds of overhead and lookups and service description languages. You use basically a communication protocol called REST, Representational State Transfer. And that's just a complex way of describing the use of a URL to stand for information. So if you want to access information from another web server, your web server simply requests a URL, and what comes back from that other server is the information that you requested. That sounds like incredibly dull and dry. So that's, that's funny. You know, and there's the critical theory side of me that wants to sit there and analyze this and tell you And like that. <laughs> so now, again, what's interesting about REST isn't the technology, but the thing that it replaces, right? REST is a point-to-point -point communication protocol. One server contacts another server directly. And this is different from the web services communication protocol because you have to look up the, the thing that you're trying to connect in a registry. And that's typically a centralized repository of web services and web services functions. So we're doing away with the centralized repository. We're, we're doing away with the coordination function that happens in a web services environment. And all the coordination that needs to happen takes place on the spot in the instance of the information transfer. Don't worry, this is being recorded. So if that didn't make sense, you can go back and I've got video going here, they've got video there, 49 cents, $10,000. <laughs> Mine will be up first. <laughs> I love doing that. All of this, these things create 
a, a whole mess of interactions basically under the heading of mashups. And you've, you've already begun to see mashups in the news, right? Where you take information from one website. <laughs> So the idea here is now we're able to take information from different websites and mash it up together. So you know, even these days you go to Google and, and Google, yeah. The Saskatchewan teachers at least managed to take a picture of David Crosby and a picture of me, assemble them side by side, put a slogan under them, and put that up. All I got from you guys. Uh, anyhow, but the, the thing to note here is that basically Web 2.0 is doing to web servers, to web application programs, the same thing that social networking is doing to people, right? It's taking our typical organized and structured and sliced and diced and flaked and formed ways of organizing whatever, and it's breaking that apart so that the organizations are often point to point, they're often random, they're, they're unstructured, they're ad hoc, they're on an as needed basis. And that, that allows us to connect things that would typically not be connected, or would typically be connected only in very unusual circumstances. Finally, well not finally, but another aspect of Web 2.0 is something called JSON. JavaScript Object Notation is what JSON stands for, J-S-O-N. And what JSON does is, well, I think personally that JSON, the long-term future of JSON is that it will replace XML. Uh, and if you guys have invested a lot in XML, you might want to think about that statement. JSON is basically the representation of data in, Java, in JavaScript object notation. Now that does two things. First of all, it gives you data, this very same data that you can put in an XML file, it gives you data in JavaScript notation, which means you can take your data, you put it in your script, it's ready to go. No parsing, no fuss, no muss, it's there, it's ready to immediately access and use. Secondly, JSON is something that solves what it has come to be known as the, as the cross-domain scripting problem. No, that might not be that. That's funny. That's the cross-domain scripting problem. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, just for the record, you notice how I've set up my video here, and I don't have a director, like, focusing on me or whatever, all of those slides are going to be on that video. <laughs> so the whole world will know, anyhow. Uh, remember I talked about browser scripting problems, right? And those of you who worked in learning objects and SCORM and all of this ran into that problem. You have a learning object here on domain abc.com, you have an LMS here on def.com, how do you make the learning object interact with the learning management system. Because of cross-domain scripting restrictions, they can't talk to each other. The learning management system cannot use state information from the learning object, because if you could, you would create a learning object that steals cookies, and you don't want to do that. But JSON solves this by what is known as the tag hack. And basically what you do is you create an HTML page, and in the HTML, in the HTML page, in the header of the page, you create a script tag. And in that script tag, you import a JavaScript file where that JavaScript file is a JSON dataset. And then that, that dataset can be imported from anywhere, any domain. But when it's imported in that way, it is treated as part of the original page. So, if you create a learning object as a JSON object, that object can be located anywhere in the world and yet run on any LMS as though it were sitting right on that very server. 
uh, found may have sounded like a lot of gobbledygook. So the bottom line is, if it did sound like gobbledygook, it means that our learning objects are going to change shape in the future. They are going to be made out of something very similar to JSON, if not exactly JSON, and that will make them a lot more portable than they are today. Okay, so, just checking in my time. They have a clock here. There's so many places they don't have a clock. <laughs> uh, yeah, I probably could, but I won't. <laughs> I'd have to think about that. I mean, there are, I mean, that, that comment raises the serious question. There are security implications for JSON, right? Because JSON does solve the cross-domain scripting problem, which means it does provide access to, to the browser state, which means, in theory, it could violate your security, which means that you can't just be randomly, willy-nilly, bringing in JSON objects. So, if you write software that uses this stuff, your software has to run some security protocols or something in order to make sure that the JSON objects are not objects that are going to do nasty things to your data. So, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot more to be said about JSON than what I've just said here. So that was a good point. Everybody wants to roll the world out. Ooh. Empirically, it is well, false, but anyhow. Uh, so, sorry, I've got uh, 40 minutes of content and 15 minutes of time, so I'm just quickly reallocating priorities as I stand here. That's the smoke coming out of my ear. Okay, the collaborative processes that I outlined at the beginning of the talk are now more and more being assisted by Web 2.0 technologies. And I can just run through some of these very quickly. Team creation, for example. We are seeing team creation functions more and more being performed by systems such as Yahoo Groups or Google Groups, which I don't like, or even Moodle, uh, Australia's EDNA, Education Network Australia, and education.au. Use Moodle, which is an open source learning management tool, in order to assist in the formation of special interest groups. And they have tens of thousands of educators, pretty much every educator in Alberta, in, Alberta, in Australia, uh, plugged into this uh, Moodle system, and this Moodle system is basically nothing more than a learning management system that they use as a discussion board. Uh, there are many other types of content management systems that allow people to engage in team creation uh, processes, everything from open source applications like Drupal to very expensive applications, which we don't want to think about. Actually, this is supposed to end at 2, not 2.15, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, I have even less time than I thought I did. Okay, I'm going to skip that. I want to, I want to talk... I want to give you the takeaway of the, what it is if you are designing or looking at this kind of technology, what to look for. And the takeaway is that technologies that work well in a distributed Web 2.0 environment are technologies that embody the following four characteristics. Number one, they support diversity. That is to say, they support the gathering of information and the making of connections from many different and knowably different sources. Secondly, they support autonomy. That is to say, they do not attempt to coordinate, rather they, they leave the coordination, they leave the decision on priorities, values, goals, etc. to individual members of the network. Third, they support openness. That is to say, they don't create exclusive groups, they don't create barriers, rather they they are loose, they are open, they allow content and members to go in and out of, uh, of the network. And then fourth, they support interactivity, that is to say, the knowledge created by these networks is not additive, it is not cumulative, it is not based on counting votes, but rather it is created 
uh, the interaction of members with each other, and it is what is known in the philosophical literature as emergent knowledge, or knowledge that is essentially the patterns of interactivity that can be seen and recognized by viewers looking at the network from a distance. I really wish I had more time, but I very obviously don't. I thank you for your patience and for your humor, and I hope you found this an interesting exercise. Thank you. <laughs>